Hello and welcome. Plugin America presents the webinar, Everything You Wanted to Know About Charging Stations But Were Afraid to Ask the Salesperson. Our presenters are Tom Saxton and Richard Kelly from Plugin America. In case you didn't know, Plugin America is a nonprofit corporation that advocates the use of electric vehicles. It began as a group of drivers of the GM EV1 and other electric cars of that era. It later became a chapter of the Electric Auto Association and grew to become a leading organization in the EV space. Plug-in America drives change. We accelerate the shift to plug-in vehicles powered by clean, affordable domestic electricity to reduce our nation's dependence on petroleum and improve the global environment. The slides and video of this webinar should become available at our website in about a week. So if you happen to miss a web address or some other detail during the presentations, you will be able to rediscover it then. We will be taking questions near the end of the webinar. Just type your questions into the questions box at the lower right of your screen, and we will probably answer them on audio. So. Let us begin with our first presenter, Tom Saxton. Tom has been researching electric vehicles since 2006 and driving electric since 2008. Through blogging, car shows, owner communities, media interviews, and testimony before the Washington State Legislature, Tom has over five years of experience with electric vehicles and charging stations. So, Tom, uh, why don't you go ahead and get us started on this story. Okay, there we go, and I'm live again. Thanks, Dave. Uh, let's see, I'd like to just start out with what we're uh, trying to get done today. Uh, our, for this webinar, our intended audience is anyone who's uh, considering purchasing an electric vehicle charging station for a residential, public, or fleet use. And uh, we're going to talk about what sort of charging station options there are and the various features. So we'll talk a lot about the equipment, but we're not going to talk about the sort of larger process that's required to create an effective charging station, especially in a, a public or a fleet setting. So we're only covering the equipment today. And here's a list of all the things you might look for in charging stations. At the top, we, uh, we start with uh, the sort of basic requirements that are required just to be uh, compliant with the standard. And that means that the charging cable is unpowered until it's actually plugged into a vehicle. It has ground fault detection, so if there's a short out, the power will get cut off. And also, it communicates the current limit to the vehicle so the vehicle doesn't draw more current than is safe from that circuit. And then uh, I won't bother reading all the possible premium features that might be pretty important to you, but that's the list I came up with of things that you might want to look for that will differentiate uh, different charging stations and help guide your uh, choice. And just to get things started, I want to talk a little bit about accessibility. Uh, obviously, it's going to be important for uh, people in wheelchairs to be able to get at charging equipment. And here in the top slide, I show you a site that has a pretty good design. And you can also see these are uh, two blink stations there in front of the two leafs. And you can see that blink makes a station that has the, the cord and the card reader are both at a lower level to make them easier to reach. So that's one thing you might want to look for. The photo on the lower left shows another site that has an awesome site design. I mean, there's a very, there's a good place for unloading a wheelchair from a ramp or otherwise, and then clear an open sidewalk over to the charging station. Uh, one possible issue there is you can see there's a concrete pedestal, pedestal around that station, which makes it hard to get close to the station. And also the card readers sort of high up on that station. I didn't have a ruler with me when I visited this site, so I couldn't measure it. But it's a, another thing to think about. And then finally in the lower right, we have a, a photo of a site that's the opposite of accessible. The spaces are very close together. There's a curb between where the cars are and where the stations are. And the stations are set back pretty far. And you can't see it too well here, but there's actually a slope up the up the you know, planting area there that makes those stations pretty hard to get 
add even if you have full use of all your limbs. So anyway, these are things you might want to think about when you're designing a site and also when you're choosing a station. So let's start with the easiest and cheapest stuff. All of the production electric vehicles that I'm aware of come with uh, a charging cord that lets you charge the electric vehicle off of a regular 120 volt outlet. And the, on the left hand photo there you can see the cord set that comes with the Nissan LEAF. And uh, although that charging is pretty slow, uh, with an overnight charge you can get say 40 or 50 miles of range, which if you're only driving 30 miles a day that's going to totally take care of your charging. So that's actually a, a, a viable solution for a lot of drivers. Even Tesla Roadster owners that have a gigantic battery, uh, many of them use 120 volt to charge just because their daily driving is low enough that, uh, that they can charge overnight easily and they've got enough extra space that if they have to do a long drive one day, they'll still be able to do their normal drive the next day even if they don't get all the way full. And 120 volt charging is uh, interesting for home, but it's, it's also probably the best choice for charging at an airport where cars are going to be parked for you know, multiple days. And also if you're providing charging at a work location while your employees are there for eight or nine hours a day, that's a, that's a nice long time to charge and they can pick up 40 or 50 miles of range. So that can be a, a great solution. Obviously if you've got the outlets, then your install cost is zero and, uh, and that can be a big savings. And you know, at least in a residential setting, if you're interested in monitoring how much power you're actually using from your car, then a $20 kilowatt will allow you to uh, monitor your energy use uh, without you know, spending a bunch of money on a big fancy station. So well, let's go up to uh, level two cord sets. So level two means charging from uh, 208 or 240 volts. It'll give you typically more than twice the charging uh, speed for the same current as you get off of 120 volts. And we have uh, several options here. The one in the upper left is the Clipper Creek LCS. It uh, allows you to charge your electric vehicle at, I'm looking at the spec here, at uh, 20 amps and 240 volts. It has an auto reset ground fault circuit interrupter. Uh, so that's a, that's a pretty nice unit. Uh, uh, next to that on the upper right, that's the cord set that comes with the leaf and the folks at evsupgrade.com can take the 120 volt leaf cord set and turn it into a 240 volt uh, cord set that will charge it up to 16 amps and so that will let you charge a leaf at its maximum rate of 3.3 kilowatts and it's a fairly inexpensive way to get uh, 240 volt charging. Uh, it, on the bottom left that's an SPX unit, it's the Power Express. It can supply up to 32 amps if a vehicle can actually take advantage of that. Uh, that unit happens to have very low ghost power meaning that when it's just plugged in but not charging a vehicle, it draws very little power, so that's pretty nice for the energy conscious folks. That unit, though, is not Tesla compatible, so Tesla Roadster owners can't use it, and I, I don't know whether Model S will have the same issue or not. And the photo in the lower right shows uh, uh, Tesla Roadster using uh, a level two cord set to plug in an RV park and it illustrates that if you have uh, this 240 volt capability with a portable charger you can take it to your friend's house and charge off of their dryer outlet or even do something as wacky as uh, pulling into an RV park to get a charge. And the next step up are uh, basic level two wall stations. So these stations do just what you need them to do. They will charge your car and uh, but they don't you know offer too many bells and whistles. The one on the upper left is a Legrand unit. It's American made. It supports up to 240 volts and 16 amps so it'll charge a leaf or a volt at their maximum charge rate. It has an auto reset feature after a, after a power problem. 
the, and in the center there, there's a GE Watt station. That'll supply uh, up to 30 amps, so that'll charge up to the full charge rate of a uh, Ford Focus, the upcoming Ford Focus Electric, and also the, the, the later model, or I guess the next year model of Nissan Leaf will also support the 6.6 .6 kilowatts, so this guy will take care of that as well. Uh, it has a power switch, so you can turn the power off when you're not using it, so that gets rid of all of that energy use while it's just idle, so that's kind of cool. And uh, then the third one is an AeroVironment EVSE RS that will also do up to 240 volts and 30 amps. It's the default choice that Nissan offers uh, LEAF owners, although, of course, LEAF owners are, choose, are free to choose any compatible uh, level two charging station for what they put in their garage. And then down at the bottom, you know, I love these low-tech solutions for monitoring your power. That's just a, a simple electric meter. You can get uh, the meter and the mounting box for under 30 bucks uh, from HylaiaMeter.com, and that gives you a nice way if you want to separately monitor how much energy you're spending on your driving without buying a, a big fancy level two station. And the next step up from there are high-end level two stations. So the, the standard for level two charging actually goes all the way up to 80 amps, which is 19.2 kilowatts. So they can actually charge a lot faster than what the Leaf and the Volt, for example, can use. The Tesla Roadster can actually charge it up to 70 amps. And there's a photograph of a uh, Tesla Roadster plugged into a, uh, it's a Tesla high power wall connector in a garage. And that box is very similar to the Clipper Creek CS100, which is Clipper Creek's high end unit that'll support up to 240 volts and 75 amps. It has uh, auto reset on a ground fault, so that means if if the unit detects a ground fault, it'll uh, cut off the power and wait a little while and try again, just in case it was just some uh, you know, intermittent issue and not a real problem. Uh, the Clipper Creek stations are also nice that uh, if you lose power when it starts back up, if it's plugged into a car, it'll wait a variable amount of time from, you know, I don't know, a few minutes to maybe tens of minutes before it powers back up, and that's kind of cool so that if you have you know multiple of these units at a at a given site when the power comes back on they don't all power up and start drawing maximum power all at once which i'm sure the the grid will appreciate that sort of polite behavior uh yeah there's uh we're expecting a, another 70 amp unit from eaton i haven't actually seen that that's available yet but it's expected soon and then finally, the last photo in the lower right there is the Tesla HPC2, which is their level two charging unit for uh, Model S. And uh, uh, one thing to bear in mind is that the Roadster has a connector that uh, Tesla had to choose before there was a standard, so it uses a non-standard plug. So if you happen to run into one of these HPCs in the wild, uh, it's got the wrong plug and you won't be able to use it on your Leaf. But the Clipper Creek CS100 uses the standard J1772 connector. Likewise, Model S has a different proprietary Tesla connector. So they are the, the Tesla chargers won't work on a Leaf, but that Model S does have a, or is supposed to have a little adapter that will make it easy for Tesla owners to use the standard uh, J1772 stations. And that concludes my segment of the show. So, uh, Dave, if you'd like to take things back and hand things on. Okay, thank you, Tom. Uh, well, our next presenter is Richard Kelly. Uh, Richard is a programmer slash analyst for the University of California. He is passionate about solar power and energy efficiency and has driven converted and factory built highway speed electric vehicles since 2003. He is Plugin America's Director of IT and Editor of the Plugin America Accessory Tracker, the most comprehensive listing of charging equipment on the web. So, Richard, please continue taking us up this ladder that we're, that we're going up. 
Okay, thank you, Dave, and thank you, Tom. Um, I hate to follow the sexiest uh, level two charger uh, uh, or EVSE around uh, the Tesla uh, with these, but we're coming back down to earth here. And uh, these we uh, categorized as commercial industrial, and this would be what you would want to install if you have, uh, if you're a property owner uh, or a business owner, and you would like to offer uh, free charging to your uh, customers or your employees and oops, I'm sorry and um, what we have here is the shore power unit and that's actually not a level 2 photo so ignore the photo but that's a very configurable unit in that form factor the the tower you can order it with a combination of level 1 level 2 plugs or uh, multiple level 2 plugs uh, or all level one, which is actually the photo you're seeing there. The SPX unit in the center uh, is interesting because the cord set that Tom showed earlier, the guts, the electronics, are just slid into that pole there, and they're the same electronics. This is a great idea from a company standpoint because they get one, uh, they, they do testing on one unit, they get one, uh, do, they do safety testing on one unit, and they sell it in multiple form factors. And by the way, the uh, top of that unit is slanted. I was talking to the representative at EVS 26, and he said that it's slanted like that so you don't leave your soda on it. Um, I think it might also be good for, to prevent the birds from sitting on it, making a mess. Uh, Eaton uh, is the little, blue, the little box with the blue top, and uh, that is a nice unit. And the, uh, again, we see Clipper Creek here. This is a CS40, a very common unit we see in uh, parking lots. And what you, what you want to look at when you're looking for a commercial industrial unit is uh, what it's made out of and uh, the, the durability of it, um, how the cord uh, material uh, behaves. Uh, you, you don't want something cheap out there. And uh, I think that's all I have on those. Sorry about that. Now, at this point, we're getting into the topic of networks. Um, this area has just exploded in the last year. Um, up also, the number of, of stations has exploded, too. But the amount, number of companies that are acting as um, EVSPs, or electric vehicle service providers, is amazing. And uh, what, what we have here is a couple examples, uh, ChargePoint. Uh, is uh, a big example. Now they have uh, quite a network of resellers and hard and partners, hardware partners. Uh, you might see charge point stage. Uh, you might see, uh, for example, uh, in in a certain geographical area, you might see. I'm going to have to. Sorry, I'm going to have to make this go a little smaller here because I can't look at my notes at the same time. So I apologize. Is that okay right here, or should I make the the is that visible still, Dave? Yeah, that's visible. It'd be nice to have it a little larger, but it's still it's still visible. Okay, yeah, because I'm pre prevented from seeing my notes here. Sorry. Um, so what we have is um, a huge ecosystem behind uh, these EVSPs, and the charge point system, for example, includes geographical partners, uh, regional resellers like Beam, 350 Green. Car Charging Group, Lilypad EV, Charge Northwest, which is a huge group. And uh, Blink uh, is another uh, very big EVSP. They are publicly traded. Uh, they uh, are, have a funded project behind them called the EV Project, which uh, originally received a grant of $100 million and has since, I believe, reached uh, a total of over $200 million to date. So they have a huge network of site partners as well, uh, IKEA, Walmart, uh, Kohl's. And uh, GE is coming on board too with their uh, network. And uh, they have what they call Watt Station Connect. And this system isn't quite as full featured as, as uh, the, the existing systems. And, um, but they have already have a large user base installed base, which includes many stations in the United States and in Europe. 
So uh, the bottom line here is uh, this field has many players, and you want to uh, learn all you can about them before you decide to join with one of them. Uh, what they offer is they offer exposure for your site. You get, you get with them, you have them uh, set up your site, and you will be on their locators. They all have apps for smartphones uh, in the works or, or available already. And some of these um, some of these networks are already uh, partnering with car companies like like Nissan to have your station immediately appear inside drivers' vehicles, uh, which is fantastic. Um, of course, they also do payment processing and uh, they do a lot of reporting and monitoring. So if you feel like you have a use case where you need to watch what's happening with your units and how, how drivers are using them and maybe uh, do some fancy uh, payment uh, uh, systems where you charge different uh, amounts at different times, then you want to probably consider these networks. And there are many others. There's at least 12 others I have not mentioned here. Um, many of the other manufacturers of, of stations uh, probably have systems like this in, in the works, and we're just not aware of them. So um, these are the stations that work with those networks. The first one here is a SEMA Connect, and it's a SEMA, SEMA charge uh, by SEMA Connect. The second one is called a GridBot. This is a Blink, and this is the charge point system. This is actually made by Coulomb. And these are very common. Um, I don't know exactly what more to say on those uh, at this point. Um, some, if those those systems are basically, let me go back to this. Um, this the network systems are basically one-stop shops. They'll do everything from site promotion to payments to uh, maintenance in some cases. And in some cases, the networks like the Blink station, they're owned and operated, I believe, by Blink. So if you're the type of owner who, uh, site owner who just wants to have these devices on your property, but you don't necessarily want it to get into the business of, of uh, managing and maintaining these systems, then uh, again, that's where the network systems shine. Now, if you want just some of the features of the network systems, like uh, payment processing, for example, uh, there are other ways to go about it. Uh, there's an interesting system on the left there uh, by Liberty Plugins, and this is a, a system the owner, uh, or actually a rep of the company, uh, described it to me as something like what you would use as a, at a car wash, where you pay at the pump and you get a code, and you go to the car wash, enter the code, and you get a car wash. That's a similar system. It's a time-synchronized system. And it requires no, absolutely no connection or wires between the payment system and the uh, and the charge station. That they have partnered with quite a few uh, EVSE manufacturers, and they've also partnered with some pay by phone companies. Um, many units offer uh, a point of sale type option. The black box on the right there is a box that comes as an option to the shore power unit, and it allows somebody to swipe a credit card and it goes through the network, the internet, to a back-end system to, to process the payment. Uh, there are some fees involved um, with all these systems actually and uh, there are, usually they involve uh, some sort of uh, monthly or annual fee and some sort of transaction fee. Uh, what's coming online here uh, it's really uh, kind of uh, some of these companies are pioneering the concept of pay by phone, and uh, SEMA Connect has a system. Uh, they're partnering with mobile now as well. And I wanted to mention another option is simply uh, there's there's ways to get money that don't involve the driver. So if you switch to a model, for example, the advertising revenue model. Uh, that one is simpler because you just get your money from your advertisers and the drivers just walk up and use the systems, use the devices and don't have to swipe a card or even belong to a network. So that's something to consider. And I'm going to uh, show a unit like that uh, later that's designed for advertising. Okay, so this is kind of exciting. Um, these are actually kind of sexy like that Tesla unit. Uh, the 
quick chargers. Now this is these are now we're getting into the world of Chatamo, and up until now, level two uh, has a lot of bells and whistles, and you can buy a lot of networking options, but Frankly, the power exchange, the power transfer that's happening between the station and the vehicle is simply um, closing a relay. It's no, no more complicated than plugging in a toaster. Uh, these, now we're getting into units where the voltage involved and the amperage involved is so great that the car can't handle it on its own. So the car, what it does is it communicates with the station, and these are truly ch called chargers, and they have to do what the car says. So the car says, you know, give me a certain voltage, then, it, then the station has to comply. So this is a, a whole different world. It's basically the car saying to the station, you know, I'm all yours, big boy, and you take over. So the important thing to look for here is that the stations are very compliant with the standard and that they listen to the car. What you're looking for here is the station should uh, comply with Chatamo and um, if the if the car says, I, I need you to stop supplying that voltage, the station needs to comply very quickly. These little gems here are very small versions of these quick chargers. Um, most people haven't seen these yet. The left one is uh, made by a Swiss company, and it uh, is, let's see, it is 20 kilowatts, and it it's priced at about twenty thousand dollars U.S. The then that one, by the way, has to plug into four hundred volt AC three phase. The one on the right is called an Andromeda Power Orca Mobile. That one can be configured to be a fifty watt fifty kilowatt charger, uh, which is Im impressive. And this one is selling for twenty five thousand. And this one has the um, ability to plug into quite a wide variety of input sources. So if you uh, had, if money was no object, this could be uh, a very, very fancy home charger. Um, a more typical use case would be is if you own a business and you have several of these, uh, several plug-in cars, and you want to roll this out, and charge a couple cars, and maybe roll it back in so you don't have a, a fixed station. So this is a very uh, exciting area here. Now we get into the pedestal quick chargers. These uh, have to be mounted on the ground. They're very heavy, very big. Uh, the one on the left is an Eaton, and uh, it is it has uh, an, e an interesting feature in that internally the um, power is is uh, sectioned off into drawers, 10 kilowatts each, and um, if one of those fails, first of all, you could buy the, you could configure the unit in a variety of power um, choices, uh, and if one of those drawers fails, it actually can fall back to using less power, and the driver will probably wouldn't even notice. Um, the one in the center is really exciting. It's a kind of a game changer in the whole quick charge uh, industry, and uh, it's being put out by Nissan, built by Sumitomo, and it's supposed to be under ten thousand dollars I haven't heard of one actually being delivered yet uh, but at that price point uh, you're gonna see a lot of those get installed the one on the right is by EFASEC I hope I pronounced that correctly and um, it is uh, interesting in that they'll configure that front panel for you um, to suit your needs. It could, it could be advertising or it could uh, advertise your business. It's also a very high power um, charger. And this uh, possibly, I'm going to show you a picture of this in the next slide. Uh, this isn't really the whole uh, charger. I believe this is what's referred to as the power post. And uh, the, you'll see in the next slide that the rest of it is, is in a different box. Now, um, these are chargers that we're seeing uh, installed in different places uh, based on grants that are available. Um, I'll, I'll mention where each of these, uh, where you could see one of these. Um, the one on the upper left is, the, again, the uh, FSEC, and you could see that there's a big box uh, near it on another platform. So I assume that they're both uh, connected and that the 
a lot of the work is being done by the big box. That's in Stanford uh, Plaza uh, up in Northern California. The, um, on, if we jump over to the right, um, Oregon has completed most of the uh, sections of its green highway project and this station is, is a photo of one of those. Um, Washington is, is having a kickoff uh, or a ribbon cutting for four sites, I believe, uh, next week. And so that's very exciting. That uh, highway is supposed to reach from Canada to California. And the Blink station down below is uh, designed partly for advertising. It's got a, a wide uh, surface area there for, for graphics. Um, now, at this stage, um, you are, th these are something you would want to consider if you're installing um, corridor type charging, and that's what they've uh, chosen in Oregon and Washington, and at this level, what I would think would be uh, very important is um, reliability and the service policy that you get with the EVSP and the, the customer service because I think uh, at this point what you not want to have happen is have a family stuck somewhere because they counted on a charge and couldn't get it. So I think the service levels with the company's AeroVironment um, uh, charge point and uh, blink uh, would be very important here. Um, here, this is kind of a fun slide. Uh, this a couple of these photos were taken at EVS 26. The slide on the left is, I mean, the photo on the left is a charger that borrows the design concept from the Menekes charger in Europe, uh, which is a bring your own cord, BYOC charger, and the driver uh, is expected to have a cord of their own in the car, so you can see where it plugs in, which is nice for vandalism. Uh, you're not going to have your copper stolen, and uh, you always know you have a nice cord to use. Um, the Volta in the center is designed for advertising. In fact, the back panel is is brilliant. It's it's huge, a huge graphic. I haven't seen one of these in action, but they look very sexy. Um, they're uh, mostly based in Hawaii, and um, the ones on the right is a new area of charging that is exciting for technical reasons. Um, back in the 90s there was inductive charging, uh, which was common. Uh, GM used it in the MagnaCharge system, and this is basically the same concept as a transformer where uh, you have magnetic induction uh, sending power from one side to the other. And in, um, at MIT just recently, um, not too many years ago, uh, there was a lot of research into sending power over the air. And as of um, a couple of years ago, they filed for some patents, and uh, they have made a lot of progress. Now, what's the issue here is that there's uh, any sort of in, uh, wireless transfer of power like this has potentially more efficiency losses than conductive um, connections. The uh, the one at the top there is the plugless power system by Evitran. The center one is the Delphi system. And these use a different a, a form of um, inductive coupling called resonant coupling instead of conventional in, conventional inductive coupling. It's just very exciting. Now, um, what does Plug in America want? We um, and I'm sorry, I'm going to have to pick up my slide here again. We uh, met with the. California Public Utilities Commission last month. Uh, re this was regarding the NRG settlement, um, and where NRG, by the way, is a uh, is uh, the successor to Dynegy, which is a company that was um, that settled with California over the ca the power crisis in 2001, and they are going to be launching a, a large network in California of chargers, really a, a, a ton of chargers and infrastructure. Um, so we met with the California Public Utilities Commission last month, and we outlined some basic principles, so I wanted to share those with you all. And these are based on the, the consumer perspective of EV drivers. Um, first of all, it's open access. Uh, we, we believe that 
someone should be able to uh, walk up to a charger and use it whether they're part of um, a certain subscriber network or not. Uh, any EV driver should just be able to go up to a charger and use it, even if they have to use an 800 number or a credit card swipe. And uh, we, we feel that this is very important. Um, I also would, would love to see these EVSEs continue to work in case of a network outage. We've heard of um, situations where the charger is fine, the electricity is fine, the car is fine, but the charger won't give up the juice. So uh, as far as open access goes, I would like to see that happen. Um, interoperability, this is a requirement uh, where EV drivers don't ha can join one club and yet have access to all the networks. So obviously this is not the case today where you see photos out there of people with their uh, FOBs and cards, RFID cards. Uh, this is uh, something we would like to see happen. These companies would work together. Uh, transparency, we, we feel that uh, when you pull up to a charger, it has to be clear how much you will be charged. It should also be reported in the uh, locator app on the web um, so that consumers can make a wise choice before they even decide to drive to a charging station. And finally, uh, consumer pricing protection. Uh, this is the concept that there needs to be a mechanism in place uh, to prevent price gouging. Of at remote charging locations, so we don't want to see situations where you have a long drive, you expect to get a charge somewhere, and and they're charging thirty to forty dollars a charge, um, trying to head that off. So at this point, um, I think that's my last slide. We have some resources here, and I believe I'm going to send it back to Dave, and we're going to do some question and answer. Okay. Well, thank you very much there, Richard. I would actually like to show your accessory tracker and uh, ask you a little bit about it uh, while we're here, because uh, we did mention it a while ago, and this is the accessory tracker that we have at the PluginAmerica.org uh, website. Uh, Richard, can you tell us a little bit about this, this wealth of knowledge we have right here in the tracker? Sure. We have over 100 units listed, and uh, we're, we're branching out to uh, new types of uh, entries. For example, the latest is solar carports. So it's not just charging stations or EVSE. Um, you can use the choices there, uh, the drop-down boxes, to choose either uh, EVSE or charger. Chargers would indicate a quick charger. Uh, software is apps for your smartphone. And uh, the second choice there is level. You can you can just isolate a certain level of charge level. And and three, by the way, I wanted to mention QC quick charge D is DC quick charge. It is not level three. I still see that listed in uh, a lot of press uh, reports. Um, so level three there is not really out yet. And then NRTL certified. That's uh, the concept that uh, these companies, when they build their product, they send it to an independent lab to test it uh, for certain standards to see if it complies. And um, that's critical uh, in some uh, instances for you to get a permit. And uh, some of these companies use UL, and some of them use a new company, well, it's not a new company, an alternate company called Intertech, which I'm seeing uh, used a lot. And uh, if you want to click in, into one of those entries, Dave. Okay. Let's do that. Um, well, let's see. How about this one you told us about, or similar to one you told us about? Well, that's just the picture. So that's just the picture. The, the, the entry the is way over here. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's an important and thing to And I want to, to mention, know. when we post this uh, presentation online, the slide deck, we will have all the photos in the slide deck link to their respective entries in the tracker. So that way, uh, we obviously can't get into every detail we'd like to during the presentation. So this way, you can really dive a little deeper into one unit. And there's comments at the bottom, too. Um, I, I would suggest that if you're feeling like you're ready to buy any certain sta any station, just please check our entry for it, because um, 
some stations have some comments that you that might dissuade you from buying it, and some stations will have comments that will encourage you. So I encourage that. Okay. Well, thanks for introducing us to the tracker. Well, let's go into our the rest of our Q and A time. Uh, we have quite a few questions uh, that came in. And uh, let me see. Oh, somebody asks, uh, let's see, they're getting a Fisker Karma, and it comes with a 120-volt uh, travel connector. Do you know if I get if I get the 240-volt European one, which comes as a travel charger, will it work in an RV camp or on any 220? If not, is there a U.S. one that is not permanently installed? I could obtain as a travel charger. Uh, uh, Tom, would you like to tackle this one? Yeah, I don't know uh, details on the equipment that Fisker is supplying, but it's a J1772 compliant car, so I would expect it to work with any J1772 compliant station. And so uh, in terms of portable units, I think the the Clipper Creek LCS, that'll do 20 amps. Uh, that should work fine, and with that you can put any kind of end you want on it, so you should be able to plug it into, say, the NEMA 1450 outlets, which is what a, an RV park refers to as 50 amp service. In terms of being able to get more than 20 amps, the only unit that, the only really portable unit I know that'll do that is the, the Tesla universal mobile connector, but it has the crazy Tesla plug on it. So I don't have a good solution for the Fisker Karma. And also I might just note that the Fisker Karma uses about twice the energy per mile that, say, the Leaf, the Volt, the Tesla Roadster use. So that means that even though you're getting the same, for the same power level, you're only probably getting about half of the range. Uh, per hour that you would with the with the other car, so that's something you'll need to take into account when you're planning your long road trips. Okay, cool. Um, thanks for that response, Tom. Um, let me throw another one at you, Tom. Maybe you have something on this. Uh, have electric dryers ever been analyzed to death, like EVSEs, by utilities and local authorities? Is transformer lo transformer loading by dryers that much different than EVSC local distribution loading? Why are local authorities requiring so much more documentation than an electric dryer or water heater installation? Yeah, so I think the thing that uh, is of concern to utilities that have actually done their homework is this notion of clustering. So if you look at a map of where all the leaf owners in the U.S. are, they're not uniformly distributed. They tend to clump in certain neighborhoods. And so if that same thing happens with electric vehicles, which I would expect that it will, that means that you'll be getting those, those sort of exceptional draws, exceptional additional draws kind of clustered. And so that means the, the transformer at the very local level, just before you get to the house, some of those might get you know, an increase in use that's unexpected. And so the utilities really want to know where electric vehicle charging stations are going in so that they can make sure that they proactively upgrade those transformers before there's a problem. So I guess they're different from dryers and that probably dryers are more uniformly distributed among homes and not as, as clumpy as plug-in electric vehicles are. Okay, thanks. Um... Uh, Richard, here's one for you. Um, can someone talk, well, I guess that would be you, Richard, about the practicality of using solar panels and battery storage, uh, AC off-the-grid solar kit to charge an electric car? I know you mentioned something about uh, uh, some kind of combined charger with solar that, uh, that that's a product that's becoming available. Okay, yeah. Um, there are... Um, it, this was was a very interesting one. In fact, uh, you could bring it up on the uh, tr the tracker as we talk. But it was a product called by Isola, and it uh, it's something you can pop up. You can build for an event, and it has a uh, set of solar panels on it. And 
I didn't see a battery bank on it though, so I don't know if this one has to be grid tied. Uh, so, if the, but it it uh, obviously you can charge using solar power. The issue is the does is is basically buffering the solar, and most people do that with a grid. So, in the case of someone who's off grid, you'd have to have a battery bank collecting that solar and then feeding it to um, the EVSE through an inverter. Okay, and is that I I solar with an I or with an E? Um, just go type other. Okay, type other. That's a good place. This is a good test. And it's right there on the bottom. Oh, okay, renews Isola. Yep, there we are. And so as we see more of these uh, come available, uh, we're going to include them in the tracker because I think this ties in great. This one comes with an EVSE attached. Oh, that's a slick little package. Okay, well, thanks. Okay, here's another question for you, Tom. Uh, somebody asking for some advice. At a business, should I size the service for a Nissan Leaf, or should I plan for higher current, such as the Tesla Model S? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I think businesses that are putting in charging stations, they're probably going to expect those to, to be around for a while, to last for three years, five years, ten years. And I think over that time frame, we're going to see uh, more and more cars have higher power depend, demand. So the LEAF is currently a 3.3 kilowatt car. We know that the Ford Focus is doubling that and you know making sort of a lot of PR bragging about it. The LEAF is going to double that to 6.6 .6 kilowatts next year. The Model S is coming out. It's a 10 kilowatt base and you can actually put a second charger in the car so that you get 20 kilowatt capability. Tesla Roadsters at uh, 16.8 kilowatts. So, you know, if you're thinking uh, long term, you definitely want to at least plan for higher power. So, you know, maybe you don't want to buy a, a 70 amp station today, but if you're, uh, you know, cutting a trench through your parking lot to run wires, then you definitely want to run. I would say make it easy to upgrade to an 80 amp station in, in the future. In terms of what you do today, you know, I think it's a little bit about uh, who you expect your clientele to be. So, you know, a high-end hotel, for example, might want to uh, have nice charging for the Model S, whereas, you know, other places maybe uh, don't care as much. And, you know, the other interesting thing is how long are people going to be at your site? You know, at a hotel, even the Model S with a 300-mile battery pack if, if you can set them up with a, a 30 amp charging station, so that's only seven kilowatts, that'll actually charge the car, you know, in 10 or 12 hours. So a nice overnight will ch charge a Model S from empty to full. So that's, that's going to be great for hotel customers. For, say, a restaurant that's in between two large cities, if you want to get Model S folks to stop there and eat lunch, then you're definitely going to have an advantage if you've got sort of maximum charging capability. So it really depends on the site, but definitely uh, if, you're, if you're doing expensive upgrades to lay wire or conduit or whatever, plan for eventually wanting to go to a 100 amp circuit to support 80 amp charging. Yeah, that's an important point. You want to be at a 100 amp circuit if you want to want continuous 80 amps. Uh, the rule of thumb is 80% of your breaker rating. Um, okay, well, uh, Richard, uh, here's a question for you. Uh, what's involved in upgrading from an older style public or private charging station to uh, J1772? And how expensive is it to make this conversion? Well, um, some stations, like the old AFCON stations, um, and if Clipper Creek is listening, they won't want me saying this officially, but uh, you can just change the plug on them, and uh, we have members who know how to do that, and the instructions are online. So if it's, uh, and that's because the old Clipper Creek stations the uh, and um, were 
were also J1772 compatible, but they just had a different connector. So um, if it's an old station that used the same protocol, then you're golden. Um, other stations will re probably require you to just pull it out and, and uh, you could use the, reuse the pedestal and uh, mount a new system. Uh, most old, if the station is old enough, it probably has weathered some damage, so you might want to do this anyways. Um, and uh, the, the other option I, I'm thinking about is I just want to mention there are people who are getting uh, in charger enclosures, uh, EVSEs, that we're just talking level two, and they're putting in, they're gutting them and putting in electronics, uh, home brew uh, electronics. And that's uh, something that's really up to you. Uh, if that's something that's acceptable, maybe it's acceptable for residential use, but uh, probably not commercial. So I think for most cases, I would just consider pulling it out. Uh, even even the swap out of the cord, uh, when you look at the cost involved, you're probably just going to want to decide to get a brand new Clipper Creek anyways. Okay, thanks. Um, here's a question for you, Tom, and sounds like one of those that has a yes or no answer, but I bet you there's going to be more to the story. Are all of these units that uh, were presented in the slides today using the J1772 standard. Hello, Tom. I'm not hearing you. Sorry there. Hey, if I could just add something to uh, Richard's answer to the previous question. If you have a, uh, an SPI, a small paddle induction charger, that you want to replace with the J station, please uh, contact us with the Electric Auto association because we would really love to get those old stations so that we can continue to support the older vehicles. So if you've got an old station, don't just, uh, and you want to replace it, that's great, but please don't throw the unit away. And uh, yeah, so yeah, to answer that question, yes, all of the stations that we've shown today, all the level two stations are J1772 stations. And the, the DC quick chargers were Chatamo. Okay, um, let's see here. Well, here's one for you, Richard. Uh, are there commercial opportunities for entrepreneurs to establish EVSPs? This uh, this field is is amazing to me. Um, you have companies that are getting pretty big at this point, uh, and Coulomb and Blink, they're out making partnerships uh, as fast as they can with resellers and vendors, uh, I mean site uh, owners, uh, but I think there's a lot of room for innovation in this field. You, we were asked a question uh, before this webinar began about whether it was possible to bolt on a um, payment system onto an old charger that I'm sure it's not technically very difficult so if somebody wants to maybe take on that niche niche market there's an opportunity there um, apart from that there's uh, it seems like almost every manufacturer of, of a level two station and uh, and quick chargers they're all they probably all have EVSP in their in their business plan and uh, this just allows them to offer everything that the site owner needs. Um, so I, looking at the number of, of companies that have started in this space, you would, you would be, uh, it, you'd find it daunting. But think about the fact that n almost none of these companies existed uh, two years ago. And you have to wonder how, how much more is this field going to grow? I think we don't. We have no clue, uh, and there's so many features that uh, could still be invented and offered that there, we have no clue here. Okay, um, Tom, here's one for you. Can I put an EV charger on my property and uh, charge a fee for it? Uh, sure. Uh, with a with a caveat, so in most states it's illegal to sell electricity, so you can't charge per kilowatt hour, but you could certainly charge for 
time at the charging station the same way you can bill for parking. So I think if you're set up to be able to bill for parking, you should be able to bill for charging the same way. Thank you. And uh, Richard, um, let's see. Do all quick chargers need 483 phase? Well, uh, one example um, that I showed that did not was the Andromeda Power uh, um, mobile charger. So that one took a wide variety um, of choices. Let me uh, bring up my, my list here. Um, this, this charger can be used with 208, so that would be two legs of a three-phase circuit, 240 AC, 400 AC, 280 volt AC, uh, 50 to 60 hertz, single, double, or triple phase, uh, or, uh, or this is amazing, but it even uses it even can feed off of 200 to 700 volts DC. So, so just that in shows case you that um, there, it's possible. Yeah, just in case you have over 200 that, that volts DC a, sitting around. Yeah. Well, that might be something you, I, I, I haven't thought of it until now, but maybe that's something that would be uh, usable from a battery bank. True, or directly from solar. Uh, of course, yeah. there's quite a bit of variation there, but yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Tom, uh, will the DC fast chargers that are being installed now be able to support the SAE charging standard when it is complete? Uh, you know, obviously the SAE standard isn't complete, so I can't answer that definitively, but I know that uh, Washington State put it into their contracts that they wanted the stations to be uh, upgradable or compatible with future standards. So I know at least uh, Air Environment has some plan for that. And, you know, really it makes sense that electronics that converts the input AC into output DC shouldn't have to change with the standard. So, you know, I'd expect from a technical, technical standpoint, it should be straightforward to just be able to replace the electronics that communicates with the car and controls the output voltage should be straightforward. But, you know, obviously, if you're, before you sign a contract with a, uh, a given manufacturer, you want to make sure that that uh, base is covered if it's important to you. Okay, thanks. Well, we're nearing the end of our hour here, so I don't want to do too many more questions because people need to go places. Um, somebody does ask the question, will Plugin America change her name if wireless charging takes off? <laughs> uh, I, I'm open to it. What about you, Tom? <laughs> Well, you still have to plug in the charger, so. <laughs> it plugs in somewhere. That's right. Okay. Well, we also have a number of other questions here, and uh, we'll make a note of them and, uh, and review them. Uh, so we will conclude the webinar at this point. Uh, as we know, we have some people who need to go. Uh, so for everybody who is attending, you should receive a follow-up email later today and it will include a survey. We would appreciate your response to that survey, if you would please respond. Uh, also, we plan to put the slides, uh, a video of this webinar, and answers to your questions on the website. Uh, they should be there in about a week. Thank you all for attending and participating in this webinar. Thanks also go to our presenters, Tom and Richard, and to Aaron Tater for handling technical operations. I have been your host, Dave Atherton, and on behalf of Plugin America, have a good evening.